Welcome to Brains Matter, the podcast on science, curiosities, and general knowledge. I'm your host, just an ordinary guy. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Brains Matter. Today I've got Beck Lynn, Cheyenne Pereira and Cindy Lee here from the Monash Solar Decathlon team. So welcome everyone. Hi. Hi, thank you for having us. So just as a bit of a starter, could, uh, each of you uh, give us a little bit of uh, an introduction to yourself and your background and tell us what you study. Yeah, so I'm a third year student at Monash University studying chemical engineering and biomedical science. Yeah, I just, I joined the team sort of to get experience or like physical or like sort of experience that's not, um, uh, that's sort of different to uh, what we normally do uh, with our units. So I thought it would be an interesting experience for me to um, join a student team. So that's why I wanted to embark on this journey. Um, so my name's Beck and I'm currently in my sixth year of a double degree in civil engineering and architecture. Um, I also joined the team for a similar reason. So I was really interested to see like what could be done, you know, outside of your basic, you know, engineering units, that are just like tutorial question and answer type stuff. And especially because I was particularly interested in the competition itself. And I guess we'll go into that later. Mm. Um, but I also recently just completed my um, final year project as well in uh, together with the student team and uh, with a focus on Passive House, which is a, another thing altogether. Excited to be here. Um, my name is Cindy and I am a third year architecture student at Monash University. This is my first degree, so I have a background in finance and um, I work in real estate. Um, I joined the competition because I really wanted to find out what um, everyone else in engineering was doing and I thought this collaboration between engineers and architects is really important, especially um, when we go into our career field. So just as a bit of a starter, could um, you tell us what the Monash Solar Decathlon team is? So what is its premise and what does it aim to do? Our whole, the whole student team is uh, created out of entering this competition, the um, United States Department of Energy's Solar Decathlon competition. So it's a competition that's primarily held in the US, although international um, student teams are encouraged to participate. It's a, a competition just for university students and it's composed of 10 categories or contests, which are like areas of focus. Uh, and the overall goal is to design a net zero um, innovative uh, building type. So there's a few that you can enter. You can enter like attached housing or suburban single family or mixed use multifamily or elementary school, for example. And there's also a focus on powering it through renewable energy and um, reducing heating and cooling demand for the building. So primarily to do with building and architecture, hence the crossover with architecture studies for a couple of you there. Yeah. Um, and I think there's also a big focus on like mechanical engineering a little bit hvac and like myself as chemical yeah engineering um a lot of the hvac stuff um along with piping the water heating um, how we treat the water uh, how we recycle the water looking into those things is sort of another big aspect and i guess sort of the final aspect that um, i guess cindy sort of mentioned earlier with with her background was sort of in the finance and marketing side of it. So of course we don't want to just build a building that does not have a market for it. We want to build a building that, you know, ideally wants to uh, like solve a, solve a issue that's currently there. Not, not an issue, but like a gap sort of a gap in, in the housing market or in the you know, building market. or the school. So when you went into the competition, was there a set of categories that you had to choose from and you chose which one to enter or did you come with a with an idea uh, uh, some kind of um, solution that you thought was worthy of entering into the competition um so as uh, Beck said earlier so we have things called divisions uh, what they're formally called so there's 
different divisions for different types of housing. Um, but within the divisions as to what we do with it, so there's like small guidelines, like lot sizes and how many people need to live in there and like how many dwellings you could have and all that stuff. But besides those guidelines, um, there's no real uh, like fixed thing for us to do. We can take it anywhere. So as an example, with the attached housing division, which uh, I, uh, Cindy and I were a part of last year and I'm continuing on this year as well. We, there's like uh, some previous winners in who are, who are accommodating for students where we did it for public tenants. Some people will do it for seniors. Uh, some people will do it for like safe housing and like, yeah, so there's literally, um, we could, we could go with, um, any, any, anything we feel like uh, is relevant. I feel. Well, the other so, goal is to like make it, um, net zero energy and achieve like the ultimate goal of being sustainable and, um, like over like efficient highly efficient it's actually a little bit unclear in the competition what they mean by net zero but i most of the teams focus on net zero operations so um that's obviously excluding construction like carbon emissions and construction but yeah looking at ways to achieve net zero operations so it's like a minimum minimal cost for the residents um throughout the year so we're talking about primarily electricity usage yeah, heating, um, I think electricity, um, which most of it goes towards heating and cooling, as I said earlier. Do we include things in in the sustainable housing, such as um, water usage and things like that, or was that outside the scope? Um, yeah. yeah, so I can sort of answer that. So um, it's sort of a bigger focus for attached housing last year was uh, water conservation. Well, like, I mean... So while it's not the main goal, because of course the main goal is net zero, um, but of course we do want to try and save water or recycle water because it adds to the whole perspective of being environmentally friendly. Because I mean, water is not a is not a resource that's uh, like heavily abundant to all people. Like it may be abundant to us here in Australia, but it's not always abundant to everyone. And uh, yeah, so definitely uh, water conservation yeah, electricity conservation and like most of most of the um, buildings that we design do not have gas usage. Um, we try to keep it electric so we can cover it with solar panels or with renewables. Um, but yeah, even with gas, we try to try to minimize. So and minimize that as well. So I guess it's just minimizing all, all the utilities and all the costs uh, associated with the house. And I think, um, I think one of the beauties of this competition is that it can really be anything that you want so you could focus largely on recycling water um, or you could have another focus altogether and I think the competition places a lot of emphasis on having like a narrative or purpose for your design so there's a clear um, I guess client for which you're designing so for example our mixed-use multi-family building last year looked at uh, catering for students um, so creating ground floor facilities that students could use Whereas the, I think it was the single fam, single suburban family division, their design focused on um, creating a bushfire resistant home. And that's especially uh, topical for us in Australia, yeah. given yeah, what exactly. happened late last year and early this year. Going back to the monosolid decathlon team, how, how big is it? Um, we recently recruited, um, I believe, in June. Um, and now we're a team of approximately 60 students, I believe. Uh, somewhere close to uh, somewhere close to that, and yeah, so that mainly includes uh, all, all the university students, as Beck said, because um, that's the requirement for uh, to be a part of the competition. Um, include and but it's not just limited to undergraduate students. There are some master students as well, and on top of that, we have um, a couple of uh, wonderful faculty advisors um, that help us out and sort of, I guess. Uh, um, steer us in the right direction and get faculty help when uh, yeah. needed so yeah yeah I think uh, this is the third year that the team has entered the competition so for the first year that the team was created it was a very small team I actually personally wasn't on the team myself um, I joined last year and we had we started out with a really large cohort and then as the competition progressed um, some people had other commitments that they um, had to prioritize over the competition in the end, it ended up being just under 30 people. So 
roughly 10 per division. And yeah, this year we've had a huge recruitment and a lot more members. And I think just starting out now with our <clears throat> elementary school design, we've got 20 members in the team, which is a lot. But we don't know who's going to stay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can you tell me about the US Department of Energy uh, solar decathlon, the competition itself, um, what your submission was, and given the, the size of your team, how you actually split up the work and decided who did what? I guess uh, I can speak to what we did in our division last year. Um, and I think the overall process is to uh, sort of delegate division, oh, sorry, not division, um, contest lead. So like I said, there's 10 contests that are sort of like, um categories that you have to fulfill so one of them is like uh engineering one is architecture one is financial feasibility and market potential innovation etc you uh most of the teams delegated a lead for each contest and then had smaller teams within the main division um to work on each particular contest the competition is focused on the american schooling calendar so um it starts middle of the year and ends uh, middle of the next year um, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit different for us so we do our recruiting mid-year and then we start the competition towards the end of the year and then um, the design challenge is early the next year so I guess we had some challenges towards the uh, start this year in terms of with the whole COVID crisis having to move online and being unable to meet in person which was definitely interesting and last year's competition was actually moved to a fully virtual event uh, which we were all very disappointed about as um, <laughs> we were hoping to travel to the U.S. So you actually won the competition in April, didn't you? One of our teams won. So we had three um, teams of students enter into three separate divisions. So mixed-use multifamily is my team, attached mm -hmm. housing, Shein and Cindy. And uh, the winner was actually not here today, but they were the single suburban family. There's a few different stages in the competition. So mm -hmm. initially you submit your progress report to see so uh, like that's picking out of the whole cohort of all of the universities and student teams that enter. And then from that, they select finalists, which actually get to attend the competition. So um, last year, all of us were selected to be finalists, but um, only one team won. So there's around about 15 to 20 universities, like sort of worldwide that enter for each division. And out of uh, those 15 to 20, eight people are selected to finals. So essentially, by being selected to finals, you're sort of the top eight university in for that division in the world, essentially. And then from there, of course, you're, if you're the winner, um, which is the case for our single suburban family division, um, which would mean that you're the top university in that division um, across the world. So um, as Beck said earlier, Cindy and I were in the housing division last year. And um, so, yeah, essentially our... Um, attached housing complex was uh, sort of revolved around uh, um, public tenants and public housing. So mm -hmm. essentially. So j just to clarify that for people who don't um, aren't familiar with architecture or engineering concepts, attached housing is primarily around um, single wall type, the scenarios where you have shared boundaries. Is that correct? Um, yep. So essentially what's defined is you need to have uh, one or more walls that are shared between two uh, houses or what we call dwellings mm -hmm. um, but yeah as long as even even a centimeter of the wall <laughs> is shared um, it classifies as attached uh, technically yeah so uh, sort of the reason that was sort of the reason why we went with um, public housing because we wanted to um, so essentially um, what public housing what we defined it as was um, government provided housing for uh, people in need or people that um people that uh, needed housing that were um, I guess, uh, did not were unemployed or people that were the elderly people who had mobility needs or um, people that have like uh, family violence, family issues or something like that. So, so yeah, so that's why we sort of wanted to have a sort of a, it would build like a mini community, mm -hmm. um, hence the attached nature of it. So um, we opted to, for example, to not have fences in between which would, uh, which would sort of uh, promote a more um, community-driven uh, sort of environment, which is, uh, which is something that's uh, wonderful for uh, um, the target market to sort of bring them together. Um, for me, like going into attached housing, I think the, the housing um, 
it's the type of housing itself is already really sustainable because you are sharing, you can uh, have the option to share a lot of resources such as like community gardens um, and the fact that there are uh, walls that are connected and shared, it means it's efficient um, in energy con conservation. It keeps all the heating or cooling together. <laughs> but that also means that um, in terms of designing the overall shape of the house, there's a lot of ways we could go about it. And we did think of a lot of um, creative ways. I think we ended up having like five members and each one of us had more than one um, proposals, which was really <laughs> So how did you come to an agreement of what that final proposal would look like, given that each of you, each, each of you had different um, options in your head? How do we decide on that, Shian? <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, so sort of how we decided. So I guess even though we had different sort of proposals, so, um, it was sort of like an iterative approach. So we, we have like one design and then someone uh, and then we maybe the design may have like a small issue, and then someone would be like, oh, and someone would raise their hand and be like, "Oh, maybe we could try this," and then we go into a new design. So um, yeah, so and then yeah, there were times, as Cindy said, where we had multiple different designs where we did not know which one to choose. And, um, I feel like we were lucky in that, even though we had, like even at the stages we had multiple designs, we still kept coming up with new designs, yeah. uh, which uh, which may which. I guess, which may look bad, but in our case, it was good in that um, it allowed us to take all the current designs we had and sort of um, adapted together to make like a, a really good design that sort of addressed all that we needed to address. Um, so so um, what were some of those things that you're looking to address? So given the state of public housing in Australia at the moment, what particular subject areas did you look at to say that's something that we need to consider in our design and really improve on what you know what, what, did you have a list of you know three or five things such as those yeah. where you thought this is where we're going to really make a difference yeah um yeah so i guess i'll, I'll let cindy speak into the more architecture side of things uh but yeah with the engineering side i guess i'll go um so yeah i guess we we tried to sort of uh, like have windows in strategic positions that allowed enough light to come in. So uh, sort of, so like our whole idea was just sort of be as passive as possible. So by that, we mean like try to not use electricity, try to not use lighting, uh, etc. So um, yeah, so we tried to let in light as much as possible and every, um, yeah, through windows, but then we run the risk of heating the house too much during summer. And et cetera. So it was like a bit of a balance um, in between that stuff. And, uh, but yeah, ultimately the goal for it all was to try and reduce your utility bills um, because what we discovered was that um, while, while the government provides the public housing at a discounted uh, rent uh, to the tenants, they still would have to pay for like utilities and stuff like that. So, so I guess, I mean, of course, electricity bills would be covered by solar panels and uh, batteries and all that uh, stuff. But I guess water, you can't really, like, we, um, there's no real uh, way in such a small scale, like a uh, housing complex to sort of uh, have a water facility to ourselves. So yeah, that's where sort of uh, our rainwater recycling stuff uh, came in. Uh, which again, we weren't able to use for all our resources. We were just using it for garden purposes and uh, gardening purposes. And uh, yeah, so that sort of stuff. But I guess, yeah, that was sort of the underlying um, motive behind it all was to sort of reduce utility bills. But yeah, on the architecture side of things, I'll pass it on to Cindy to explain it much better than I can. Yeah, I think like the problem with the Australian property market is everyone is trying to put the most amount of housing on the least amount of land and sell it for the most amount of money. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess we, from the first step of selecting the site, 
we wanted to pick it somewhere um, that we don't need to provide parking for, um, somewhere everyone can use public transport and that in itself is a sustainable approach. And also having the most uh, structurally the house in the way that every house has a maximum amount of north facing facade so it has to we can utilize the solar energy um, we had solar panels on top of the roofs um, we had the water tanks in unnoticeable areas sort of um, like um, each house has its own community garden that everyone is encouraged to sort of like work together on probably the last one of the last things was sort of I guess with this sort of competition where it's really uh, futuristic, uh, I think one of the focus of uh, architecture uh, people, with, uh, namely uh, Cindy and the other uh, person, was to sort of blend it in with the neighborhood um, yeah. to sort of like not make it look out there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, you know, sort of allow the public tenants to be able to blend into the neighborhood without looking like, oh, the new people on the block sort of, thing, you know, <laughs> sort of uh, want to make them welcome into the pre-existing community. Yeah, I think everyone sort of thinks that a net zero energy house has to look like it's from the future, like it's all white and looking like a UFO, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> you can just, I mean, um, like our renders literally just look like any other house inside the neighborhood and that's a goal we wanted to achieve and that's what we want um, other developments and um, homeowners to be able to see and say that that's what they can live in and it's definitely achievable and it's you know they can yeah it's part of everyone's everyday life. Beck can you tell us a bit about the category that you entered and what you guys proposed in your team? We entered the mixed-use multifamily um, apartments. So I guess to break down that term, it's basically creating an apartment block that has mixed-use areas. So for example, you can make it commercial or community-based. We designed a building called uh, Student Green Apartments and we aim to provide eco-friendly student housing for predominantly international students and interstate students. Um, so that was our kind of area of focus, uh, particularly students who are pursuing, you know, tertiary education in Melbourne. We designed a five-storey building. So with the competition, it limited you to five storeys um, and it had some other restrictions like a uh, lot areas and stuff like that. We essentially designed a building with a ground level that was commercial and then four levels of residential dwellings above. Um, so with the residential dwellings, we had uh, three different types of residential dwellings. Uh, we had studios, uh, two bedrooms and four bedrooms as our dwelling types. And we had um, on the ground floor, we had a mini market as well as um, on the ground floor, we had a skill development training center and a language center as well as the mini mart, like I said before. So again, target aim, um, aim towards those interstate and international students who uh, might str be struggling with English or struggling to find employment. So we were hoping that the supermarket could provide employment opportunities um, and they can also develop their skills in the language center or, um, you know, for example, study a diploma to help them with their part-time job in the training center. Um, so upskilling and stuff like that. And I guess uh, another big focus of our design was applying uh, things like a green wall um, our design was actually split into two tower blocks so the ground floor was connected but then um, floors one to four was sort of split in the center by this green walkway that connected the two tower blocks um, as well as providing you know like a bit more light into the middle of the building and allowing apartments to all of the apartments to face onto some sort of greenery which we thought was sort of important both for um, mental health and well-being of students as well as keeping temperatures low and providing just a generally uh, cool, like cooling the facade a little bit. Would you have changed your design at all um, from last year versus this year, given the experiences you've gone through with lockdown and COVID? Yeah, I think like you said before, like there's a lot, there's been a lot of debate going on about, about like social housing and um, how, you know, the current social housing towers are probably not, uh, up to acceptable living standards and, and I think if we um, were able to redo this design we definitely consider more towards you know things that have 
been identified as issues. So like, you know, making sure there's like segregated spaces and allowing um, people to interact with their neighbours if they wish, but also to keep apart from them. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, yeah, I think going into this competition, we were a bit naive about how much work it would be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it was the first year that this division had been entered into and um I guess like we're all students and we don't really know a lot about um, designing a building. (laughs) Um, So it was definitely a big challenge for us to design something as big as this uh, mixed use multifamily complex. What was the the third category in the... The single suburban family home they designed, like I said, was uh, focused on uh, the narrative of being a bushfire resistant home. Mm -hmm. Um, And they also had a grey water system as well. The location they chose was tiny. Um, which is a location uh, they chose because of their narrative of being bushfire resistant. So they sort of wanted to have a house. They sort of wanted to show how a house um, in an area such as Tani, which is, uh, I believe is bushfire prone, um, can still uh, like be there and can still be designed. So sort of going against the um, standard of you know people wanting to move sort of away from those areas where but people would think, oh, it's inhabit- or it's, it's inhabitable because of uh, bushfires. Um, but yeah, they chose Tiny Eat. And um, yeah, and their sort of um, main sort of design choice, uh, design choices revolved around uh, being bushfire resistant, or I guess, I mean, um, so yeah, in their words, I guess, uh, I guess you can't really be 100% bushfire resistant, but you can, or bushfire proof, you can, you can just, delay the bushfires from like completely decimating your house until like relevant emergency services get there. So like essentially all their strategies to um, sort of stop the bushfire was a uh, revolt around delaying it um, until either the fuels. So of course for a bushfire, you need sort of fuels, you need wood and all that. So either getting the fuels to run out or either getting emergency services uh, there. So um, they had like fire breaks and, uh, different uh, strategies for people, uh, for the occupants living inside to escape the house. Um, and many, many, many other, uh, different features of the house that allowed um, them to uh, combat against the, uh, uh, I guess, the environmental factors of uh, areas such as tiny. So, yeah. I just wanted to add that um, I think across all three divisions, we all did research on material selection, I think at the very start. Mm-hmm. So it's like having the most efficient type of timber or um, like new technologies such as self-cooling walls and like materials that would keep the heat during the day when it's a hot day and release it when it gets cooler at night. Um, just really cool uh, technology like this. And also, because one of our instructors, Brandon, is um, from the US, so one of the tips that he gave us is that even though some of our houses, like uh, just taking the example of the bushfire, um, even though some of our houses aren't in bushfire-prone zones, people in the US don't know that, so just do it anyway. (laughs) (laughs) And So, yeah, even though, like, one of our houses is in Box Hill, um, we could still do things like bushfire proving, things like that. Yeah. That's it for like people who want to enter into international competitions. <laughs> um, well. Yeah, I guess um, it was actually a really big help having Brendan be our advisor as he was able to like give us advice on things that might confuse the American audience, for example, because, you know, the competition is lar- largely targeted towards what's well, held in the US. So all the requirements we converted into US uh, units of measurement as well to make it easier for them in terms of compar- comparing it with their like standard values and stuff and just little things like using certain phrases that perhaps Americans wouldn't understand so it was um, really handy having him be our advisor and he was definitely a huge help. Um, I just had a, a quick look at the suburban single family uh, report. I just missed something a little bit earlier when I was describing their um, what their focus was so their key uh, focus points for their design strategy was um, obviously net zero, fire resistant, but also affordable. So they were looking at um, families who've been devastated by the bushfires and being able to create affordable homes that were also bushfire resistant. And that was like sort of the drive for their design. 
Okay, so if people want to find out more about the Monosolid Decathlon team, where should they go? We have a Facebook page, which I guess most of our advertising and stuff and updates and information go through. Um, the engineering faculty also posts information about student clubs and teams on the Monash University website as well. So you could also go there for information. And we also have an email that you can contact us through. And Instagram. Oh, and Instagram, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we should just be Monash Solo Decathlon under all of them. What's the next step for for each of you? Uh, so we, as we said, we just recruited and now we're a, a pretty big team, 60 students strong. So um, I guess, so we're working towards the next design challenge, which is, um, uh, which is sort of, I guess, the deliverables or the reports and all that for it are uh, all next April, around about next April, June, um, or February to April are the main um, uh, other uh, main due dates for the de deliverables. Um, so yeah, we're all working towards that. Um, we've just started on doing work in each of our divisions and uh, sort of getting the new students into the flow of how sort of um, how sort of we work and like how and sort of getting them up to speed sort of because it it took us uh, I think last year it took us a a lot of time to get used to a lot of the programs so sort of passing a lot of the tips so that uh, it wouldn't it would be a much easier process for them uh, which uh, yeah. this year i've entered into the elementary school division so i guess similar things we're working towards uh, defining a narrative and picking a site for our um, project at the moment and it's also been actually a really good experience being on the team across last year and this year because the first year that they entered the competition it was just a handful of people and last year you know it stepped up to a, a few more people and this year the team has grown quite large so um there's been a few um interesting discussions about how the team should be run and like management positions and how we should delegate responsibilities in terms of contacting sponsors or contacting industry people um, as well as managing administration and it's all been like a really good experience um, to be on the team like through this uh, process just to have you know what worked well last year what didn't work so well and then hopefully apply it to this year and yeah like Sheen said um, last year uh, we probably had a bit of a slow start to the competition as most of us didn't really know what we were um, getting into. Um, but this year, you know, we've all had some experience under our belts and we've just kicked right into the competition and hopefully uh, we wouldn't have to, we won't have to um, do all of the design during the summer like we did last year. I don't know if this is a case for everyone, but for me personally, because I'm actually on a different campus than everyone else. So um, this year, because of COVID, I'm actually able to attend a lot more meetings um, than last year. I think last year I didn't, I couldn't attend um, most of it until later on. And luckily, Brendan let me still enter because there weren't many architecture students in there, I think for, uh, for this reason, and because we had really heavy workload. Um, but yeah, like now, I am, I have changed the division for this year. Um, I mean, elementary school for now was back. Um, but for now, we're just bouncing ideas off each other and sort of getting to know each other. Um, but I think, yeah, it's really important for everyone to be involved at the very start and sort of like having all the ideas all together and following them. <laughs> well, uh, best of luck for next year. And uh, thanks for joining me on the show today. Thank you for thank having you. us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thanks for listening to the show. You can check out the Brains Matter website at www.brainsmatter.com as you can find all the other episodes of the show there. There's also other information on the site such as guests who've been on the show and subscription details. You can also find Brains Matter on YouTube, so make sure you like and subscribe if you're a YouTube listener. If you want to support the show, 
please consider becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash brainsmatter and signing up to one of the options there. Or you can donate either once off or regularly via PayPal. All you need to do is click on one of the PayPal donation options on the right hand side of the website. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can leave an entry on this episode's show notes on the webpage or on YouTube, or you can send me an email. All my contact information can be found on the Brains Matter website. The theme music Soul of the Machine was composed and performed by Clive Weeks and is used with his permission. I hope you enjoyed the show. Bye for now.